grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God remains forever. Thank you, Father, that now as we turn to your word, that, Lord, we can place our trust in it, we put our hope in it, because it is your truth from you to us. So open our minds, open our hearts, teach us by your goodness, by your grace. Bring us into a closer walk with you. Father, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart, be pleasing to you. My Lord, my rock, and my redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. All right. I want you to turn to the Old Testament book of Daniel. And um, I want you to turn to Daniel chapter 4. We've walked through the first three chapters of this powerful book. And we've been talking about prevailing faith. The kind of faith that is not the victim of circumstances, but the kind of faith that produces courage and endurance and a stick to and eventually a courage that will help us to overcome the circumstances of our life. And that's what we've seen in the example of Daniel and his friends. So we've walked through these first three chapters, and we're going to start in chapter 4, but we're going to kind of fast forward through chapter 4, 5, and then we're going to talk about chapter 6 today, this famous story of Daniel in the lion's den. So the title of the sermon today is When Lions Roar. How do you respond when lions roar? We'll look at how Daniel responded. I want you to begin the sermon by thinking about moments in your past. You know, all of us come into this room with a past, and that past has created and conditioned us in a certain way to think about God, about God's nature, about who He is. And some of you are rather new to faith and new to church, and some of you are like me when I first came to faith. You're kind of being reoriented in some of the understandings that you had about God because your understandings as you were growing up were not quite that accurate as the Bible would describe who he is. Some of you have had the blessing, though, of growing up in a home where they, your fam- family has passed down to you a legacy of faith. And you, you receive from them an accurate understanding of who God is. I want us to think about that because Daniel, as we read about his life, we have to come and understand that it is likely that Daniel, when he was young, had a good and strong foundation in his faith. Because here he is as a teenager, stripped away from his family, everything that he had known, he ends up in this place called Babylon. And he, in that moment, resolves in his heart, the Bible says in chapter 1, he resolves in his heart that he's going to stay true to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Though away, though facing difficult circumstances, though having many crises of belief, he is going to remain firm and strong in his faith. That's prevailing faith. And that foundation, I would bet was granted to him from his family in that legacy. And we're going to see today that it just carries on throughout the decades of his life. In fact, we're going to fast forward through decades of his life. You remember in chapter 1, it started when he was a teenager. Well, a few years later, we have this experience with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. And we're not sure how long that was after the experience of Daniel's first interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's first dream. But nonetheless, a few years pass. And we end up now in chapter 4, seeing Daniel as he has become a little bit older. 25 to 30 years later, we find him in chapter 4. And what we have in chapter 4 is Nebuchadnezzar's second dream, at least his second dream that's recorded for us in Scripture. Chapter 4, if you look at it with me, you'll see that chapter 4 is basically kind of a first-person testimony of Nebuchadnezzar that Daniel records. Again, 25 to 30 years since the fiery furnace. And Nebuchadnezzar has this dream again, this vision. And so he's wondering who can interpret it. And he calls who? Daniel to come and interpret this dream for him. And Daniel basically says what the dream is all about. And he says to Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, I wish this was not about you. I wish this was about your enemies, but it's about you. And this 
vision is the vision of a tree that is strong and bountiful and abundant and healthy that produces wonderful fruit. But there comes a time when a messenger from heaven, Daniel says, will come and chop that tree down. And all that will remain is a stump. And Daniel basically says, Nebuchadnezzar, you've turned away. You've come close. He's not saying this. I'm kind of reading between the lines here. You've come close. Remember, he has come close a couple of times. You've come close to placing your trust in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Yahweh God. You've come close, but you've turned your back on him and gone back to worshiping Baal. Now, there's a lesson in and of this, and I mentioned it some last week or the week before. I can't remember. The lesson is this. Stupendous events rarely, rarely uh, create transforming faith. This is what I mean by that. Nebuchadnezzar saw these miracles take place. He saw Daniel. He came really close. He acknowledged the fact that God was the one who did it. He saw what happened with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Again, acknowledging that God was the one who did it. But he turns his back on God. Miracles, signs, rarely produce lasting faith. They impress, but they don't transform. Because Nebuchadnezzar had the experience, but he missed the meaning behind it. And so we ask for signs. God, give me a sign. Well, that creates a temporary kind of faith, but often it doesn't create a lasting kind of faith. It doesn't create transformation. And Nebuchadnezzar needed transformation. So Daniel says, listen, if you don't turn to God, he's going to uh, bring you through a time of hardship and suffering, a number of years. And sure enough, what happens? He gets that interpretation from Daniel. And Nebuchadnezzar is having this moment where he's looking out over the city of Babylon. And he says this. He says, is not this great Babylon which I have built by my own mighty power? He's saying, who needs God? Have I not built this? (laughs) Well, sure enough, the prophecy comes true. Nebuchadnezzar walks through a time, and the Bible denotes it kind of a personal time, not more of a corporate kingdom time, but a very personal time of hardships and suffering and depravity, years. And at the end of that, he comes to his senses. In the end of chapter 4, you have this acknowledgement finally, but not only acknowledgement, but I think trust. This is finally where Nebuchadnezzar got it, in my opinion. He places his faith and trust in Yahweh God. There at the end of chapter 4. And it's this powerful moment. How? You go, how? Was it signs? No, it wasn't signs. It was suffering. He came to know God through suffering. Now that's a theme we're going to hold on to. Daniel suffered and yet was very consistent and constant in his faith. All right, so that's chapter 4. Now chapter 5 begins by talking about a king named Belshazzar. We go, wow, what happened? You know, it's just kind of sprung, sprung on us. Belshazzar is this king that's, begin, that's mentioned in the beginning of chapter 5. And chapter 5 is going to ba- basically be an eyewitness account of the fall of Babylon told by Daniel. Remember in chapter 2? Remember the vision that Nebuchadnezzar had? It was this great statue that had a head of gold, chest of silver, so on and so forth, feet of clay. Well, this begins to come true because now we see the transition from the kingdom of Babylon, which lasted about 90 years, to a different kingdom that would come in and would conquer the kingdom of Babylon. So between Nebuchadnezzar and this guy named Belshazzar, the kingdom began to decline after Nebuchadnezzar. It really began to go downhill. So Nebuchadnezzar is succeeded by his son who rules for two years, and then his son is assassinated by his brother-in-law, This brother-in-law rules for four years, and then he dies, and he is succeeded by his son. A young boy is what we learn from history. A young boy who reigned for nine months, but as a boy, he was beaten to death by conspirators who rose up against him. One of those conspirators was by the name of Nabonidus. And Nabonidus is a king that's mentioned in history as a king in Babylon that reigned for 17 years. But he ultimately leads the demise of the kingdom of Babylon and is defeated by the Medes and the Persians by a guy named Cyrus. And here's what's interesting. This is what uh, we learn from history. Is that Nebuchadnezzar married several wives, but one of the wives that he had ended up marrying Nabonidus. 
Nabonidus, remember again, was a conspirator. He was not a part of the royal family. He was not a part of the lineage. And therefore, he never felt he kind of had the right to lead and the right to own royalty. So what did Nabonidus do? He married one of the widows of Nebuchadnezzar and essentially adopted the son. And that son was named Belshazzar. Now, here's where it gets really interesting with respect to the historical record of the Bible and archaeology and history in general is that the Bible talked about here in chapter 5 this king of Babylon named Belshazzar. History had no reference to Belshazzar. No reference whatsoever. It had Nabonidus, but it had no record of Belshazzar. And so, of course, the Bible was wrong. The Bible was inaccurate, right? The Bible got it wrong. Well, for years that was believed to be the case. But in the 1800s, 1854... There was a discovery of the Nabonidus Cylinder, this archaeological discovery that put all these pieces together that told the story about how Nabonidus had married a widow of Nebuchadnezzar and had adopted a son named Belshazzar, mentioned in Daniel chapter 5, and Belshazzar now co-reigned with Nabonidus. He was kind of a co-king. So the Bible was proven right, historically. And so we have the description of this guy named Belshazzar in Daniel chapter 5. Why? Because we learn from history that Nabonidus was off in another city establishing a new capital. Who remained in Babylon? Belshazzar did. And so Daniel writes about king of Babylon named Belshazzar. And basically, here in chapter 5 again, is the end of the kingdom of Babylon. King Belshazzar in chapter 5 has this experience that we've come to understand it as the handwriting on the wall, the writing on the wall. And so here from the first few chapters of Daniel, we've already got some sayings that we use in today's world, right? You've heard of leaders who have feet of clay, heads of gold but feet of clay. These are leaders who look good on the outside but really have no substance, no lasting impact. They really crumble or not very courageous. They have feet of clay. That's from Daniel chapter 1. Here, in Daniel chapter 5, we have the phrase, handwriting on the wall. You ever heard that phrase? He saw the writing on the wall? Well, we're going to come to understand what that means. Here, in Daniel chapter 5, King Belshazzar, he along with Nabonidus, the last king of Babylon, are basically experiencing a drunken orgy. And it's worse than that. They're here, and they're using, as a part of this experience, the vessels from the temple of God. The temple that, that Nebuchadnezzar had conquered and he carried off the vessels, the dishes basically. They're drinking wine from the cups that were in the temple and they're eating food sacrificed to pagan idols on the dishes from the temple and it infuriates Yahweh God. And so here is this vision. Belshazzar begins to see human fingers, a human hand that's writing a message on the wall. And he's looking around, does no, nobody else see this? <laughs> and so he tells everybody about it, and he says, who can interpret this? We have this pattern developing. Who do they call in to interpret dreams? It's Daniel, the faithful Jew Daniel. So nobody can interpret it. The queen says, hey, there's this guy named Daniel that was with your father. Let's bring him in. Daniel comes in, and he begins to interpret this handwriting on the wall. The words that were written... You'll see it in chapter 5, are the words, many, many, tekel, and parson. Sounds like spices that you might use in a, you know, some kind of dish. Here's what those words mean. Numbered, many means numbered, many, numbered, numbered. Tekel means too light, is the literal translation. And then parson is a plural, meaning divided. Numbered numbered, too light, divided. Your days are numbered. You've been weighed on the scales. And Belshazzar, you've been found wanting. You've been found too light <laughs> in God's economy. And then finally, divided. Your kingdom is divided. Here's simply what he was saying. Your days are over. Your days are over. Your rule is over. It's over with. And as they were having this party, this orgy that was going on there in the palace, we learn from history 
that the Medes and the Persians were outside the walls of Babylon and that they snuck in under the walls. They cut off the water that would flow underneath the walls. They, uh, they cut off the Euphrates River and they cut off that water as they were able to sneak under the walls and there they conquered the city of Babylon, ending the 90-year reign of the Babylonian Empire. And Daniel was an eyewitness to all of it. Isn't that awesome? He was there starting as a teenager, and now in chapter 5, guess how old he is? He's in his mid-80s. He's an old man, and he's still interpreting dreams, and he's still being faithful to God. And so, in verses 30 and 31, look at what it says. It says, that very night, the same night that Daniel interpreted that vision, that very night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed. And Darius, the Mede, received the kingdom being about 62 years old. And this is what I was reminded of. Here's here's Daniel who is transitioning between kingdoms. A guy who is remaining faithful. History is kind of passing by, but here he is remaining faithful. And I thought about myself. You know what has remained constant throughout history? And that is the remnant of God. God's faithful people. Who those civilizations come and go. Kingdoms rise and fall. They have remained faithful. And another thing that was a reminder to me was that kingdoms do come and go. They come and go. And those kingdoms that set their heart against the, way, against the ways of God are those kingdoms that fall. We're a 200-year-old country. Pretty young compared to some. But it was a reminder to me that there are no guarantees. And that only by the grace and mercy of God do we continue to exist by his love and by his grace and by his mercy. And so here's the fall of the kingdom of Babylon. So we pick it up now in chapter 6. Chapter 6, Daniel is now in his mid-80s, and he's going to have this experience that we know as Daniel in the lion's den. Let's begin to read it. Verse 1. It pleased Darius... Now let's stop there. (laughs) We got through three words. It pleased Darius. Darius is also not mentioned in history by the way. There's no historical record of him. That means two possibilities. One, the history and the archaeology is still not in. The record is not final. Maybe just as in 1854, there'll be something that will declare him to be one of the kings. More likely, the scenario is is that Darius is referring to King Cyrus, who actually did conquer the Babylonians. The word Darius is a proper name, but it's also used as a title. It means chief or king, or the one in charge. In fact, five Persian kings are referred to as Darius. So it's really likely that Daniel is calling him by his title, not by his proper or personal name. So it says, It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom, and over them three high officials, look at this, of whom Daniel was one. Wow. He was a high official In the kingdom of Babylon, under Nebuchadnezzar, the the kingdom has transitioned, and he remains a high official, to whom, look at what it says, to whom these satraps should give account. These are the wise men, okay, the wise men of the kingdom. They were going to stand and give account to Daniel so that the king might suffer no loss. And you know that these guys had to hate that. I mean, we've come into power. And who is this Jew, this exile, who has now been catapulted to this place of prominence and power where we have to report to him, and we see their jealousy. Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the high officials and satraps because, look at this, an excellent spirit was in him. This is another theme. I wish we had time for all this. This is another theme throughout all the Old Testament is that those who are in exile, those who are placed in difficult circumstances, Joseph, Abraham, these people determine in their heart, Isaiah, Jeremiah, they determine in their heart, they resolve in their heart, just as Daniel did, that they're going to remain faithful, that they're going to bloom where they're planted. And they have this thing that I'm going to give excellent service. And it builds credibility in their faith. And the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. He was going to be his right-hand man. Then the high official and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom, but they could find no ground or complaint or any fault. Wow. I wish that could be said about me. Daniel, a man who had absolute integrity, 
absolute credibility, whose enemies sought to find something to make complaint against him about, but there was nothing to be found, the Bible says, because what? Because he was faithful, and no error or fault was found in him. Well, the jealousy of these wise men grow, and they devise this plan that they're going to get King Darius, Cyrus, to sign a decree. And that decree states that anyone who is caught praying to any other god except for you, O King Cyrus, <laughs> shall be put to death, shall be thrown into the lion's den. So they play on uh, Darius's ego, right? And he signs this decree. He makes it a law. And Daniel knows this, this is going on because he's one of those wise men too. He knows that these people are conspiring against him. And look at what it says. Skip down to verse 10. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. Now, how about that? Get this picture. He's an old man in his 80s. He's been in Babylon his entire life. The kingdom shifts. He's still remaining faithful. He gets down on his knees three times a day and he gets a house where he has a window that faces toward Jerusalem, thousands of miles from where he is. And he prays in that direction three times a day, remembering the faith that was his when he was a child. Look in verse 11. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and a plea before his God. Then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. I'm down in verse 16 now. Then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. And the king declared to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve, continually deliver you. Now this was not a sarcastic statement, as Nebuchadnezzar did with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in chapter 3. Daniel had respect in King Darius's eyes. And King Darius was genuinely regretting the fact that he had signed this decree and that he had been trapped and manipulated by these wise men to the point where Daniel would need to be sent to the lion's den. And Darius is basically saying, Daniel, I've got to do this, but may your God deliver you. And so here's an outsider, a pagan, understanding the history of this guy named Daniel. Skip down to verse 19. Look at what it says. Then at the break of day, the king arose and went in haste to the den of lions. As he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths, and they have not harmed me, because I was found blameless before him, and also before you, O king, I have done no harm. Then the king was exceedingly glad, and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no kind of harm was found on him, because he had trusted in his God. Here's another miracle in the life of Daniel, separated by decades, okay? Okay? But nonetheless, another miracle. The confidence that he had in his experiences when he was young, I think were translated now into his old age, where Daniel believed that even if he were to die, that God would somehow take care of him. And we know this to be true, right? Because we learn the lessons of the scripture about what it means to have a prevailing faith. And you know this inherently to be true. You know that God doesn't always deliver us from the mouths of the lions. We learn in the scripture, even remember in chapter 3 with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They said what? Even if we die, even if God you do not deliver us, we will not bow before you, Nebuchadnezzar. We will not bend our knee. We will not deny the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. We will not, even if we die. It's the same faith that Daniel had. And sometimes when we read these miracles of the scripture, we get a little skewed in our understanding of what faith really means because we begin to think that faith always means that we won't face the lions and that faith always means that we will always be delivered from the mouths of the lions and you know that inherently to not be true and we know that inherently from the scripture that that's not always the way that things work out Isaac remained faithful to God Isaac prayed to God I'm sorry, Isaiah prayed to God. The prophet Isaiah remained faithful his entire life. Yet he was killed. 
He was executed. He was sawn in two. Jeremiah remained faithful to God. He was thrown into a pit. He was tarred and feathered. He was mocked. He was ridiculed. He had prayed. The Apostle Paul prayed. We learn from history that the Apostle Paul was beheaded. He was a martyr for his faith. Peter, the Apostle Peter, after that great transformation that occurred when he, he betrayed Christ, denied Christ, the resurrection occurred and Peter in boldness and courage began to stand up for his faith. Peter lived a life of faithfulness to God and I'm sure he prayed many times for God to deliver him. He was sent to prison many times. He experienced beatings. And ultimately we learn from history that the Apostle Peter himself was crucified upside down. Martyrs throughout the centuries who may have asked for God to relieve them of the suffering that they were about to endure but also who had faith to believe and to trust in God's will no matter what, even if it meant for them to die. Again, it's the faith that we find in Jesus. When there in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prayed, God, may this cup pass from me. But he didn't finish there. God, relieve me of this. God, if it be your will, Lord, let not this happen. But he didn't finish the prayer there. He said, not my will, but thy will be done. That's prevailing faith. That's mature faith. That's a faith that says, God, I'm praying for relief. But God, the truth is, that may not be what will glorify you. That may not be what will be best for me. And so, God, not my will, but thy will be done. And God, if it means I must walk through this challenge and walk through this hardship and walk through this lion's den, rather than be relieved of it, then God, not my will, but thy will be done. And it's immature to look at the miracles of the Bible and to believe that every time you pray for relief, that God's going to deliver it to you. That's not faith. That's not the faith of the Bible. We've got to get past this mindset that God is the genie in the bottle. We rub the lamp the right way, we say the right words, out comes what we want. He's the fast food drive through We pull up, we place our order, we pull up, we get what we want, we're on our way. That's not God. That's not the God of Daniel. That's not prevailing faith. Prevailing faith says, God, even though I have to walk through this, I will trust you for the strength and the courage to walk through this time if this is your will so what are some lessons from the lion's den let me share them real quickly with you there are three the first thing is this believers will live in a constant state of tension in this world that's just true we will why because we are not citizens of this kingdom we are not citizens of this world this is not our home there is a home that is to come in heaven We are citizens of a different kingdom, a spiritual kingdom, and we belong to that kingdom. And so, because we belong to that kingdom, and yet we must exist and live in this one, there will always be tension. Because we live under a different ruler than the system and the ruler of this world, there will be tension associated with those relationships. The truth is this, folks. We should expect to crash. We, we should expect that these worlds will collide at points and times. We should expect that the devotion of our citizenship will be challenged at moments. And there will come these times in your life where you will have to decide to whom you will be loyal. To which nation you will be loyal. To which citizenship you will be devoted to. Will it be this world's or the world's to come? Daniel is a living example of that. He was a man displaced, put in an environment that was unlike who he was. And yet in the tension, he remained true to God. So we're going to experience it. And we need to normalize that somewhat in our lives. That pain and suffering and the clash and colliding of these worlds are just going to take place. Secondly, 
Because that's so, the Christian has to remain distinctive and strong. Well, we learn this from Daniel. We must remain distinctive and strong. Not assimilate into this world, but instead be distinctive in the midst of it. And I'm not talking about necessarily be anti-culture, because this world is our parish. This is our mission field. This is where we exist. But I am talking about being countercultural. Not living under the same system as the world's. And so we have different values. We have different beliefs. And those should translate into our lives in such a way that we stand out in contrast to the rest of the world. And if we don't stand out in some kind of contrast to the rest of the world because of our faith, then we might just have to ask ourselves, what kind of faith do we have? Third, there is a way to pray faithfully in unpredictable situations. There is. There's a way to pray faithfully in unpredictable situations. Daniel was the example of that. You say, okay, well, what is that way to pray? I would describe it in two ways. We're to pray for courage. In these unpredictable, challenging circumstances, we're to pray for courage. And secondly, we're to pray for God's will. That His will would be done. Not ours, but His will. And so it goes to the heart of what our faith and what the character of our faith really is. It means a maturity in our faith that allows us to receive the answer no from God when we ask for something. That we're willing for God to say, no, I've got something else in mind. No, I want you to wait. No, I've got a better plan. I've got a bigger purpose in mind. The faith that is prevailing is the faith that says, I will receive from God the no's as well as the yeses. And I may not understand them. And I may not even like them. But my faith is beyond what I like and what I want. Because I want, ultimately, what God wants. So how do you respond when God says no to you? Do you stomp off like a little child? And you're sad and depressed and you're frustrated? And Let me give you three reasons as we close today. Three reasons that God says no. First of all, God says no when he has a bigger perspective. He has a bigger perspective. We see the tree. He sees the forest. We see only our limited view. He sees the whole picture. We see only a certain amount of time. God sees past, present, and future. He has a bigger perspective. Look at this verse in Hebrews 4. No creature is hidden from his sight. <laughs> Nothing is. But all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Here's the idea that God sees more than we see. And when he says no, we must remember that he's got the bigger perspective than we do. We are limited. We are finite in what we see and know. But God is not. Secondly, God says no when he has a better plan. Not just a bigger perspective, but a better plan. Look at Isaiah 55. I love this passage. God says this, My thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. You know what that's describing? Just humility. We think we know everything. We think we know what's best. And God, through the prophet Isaiah, reminds us, you know what, your, your thoughts are not like mine. Your ways are not like mine. My thoughts, my ways are higher than yours. I've got a better plan. And I have such respect for many of you around this room. Because this is not your first rodeo. You, you've got some experiences under your belt. Like Daniel, here's a guy in mid-80s. He's had a lifetime of devotion. He's learned to have confidence in God because he's seen God be consistent and faithful to him. And I see people, some of whom are in this church, and I talk to them, I talked to one this week, who've had really difficult experiences in life. Some of us would look at these experiences and we go, wow, I don't know how you could endure such hardships and make it through. And I, I think of people like that, people like you, 
and I go, man, look at their lives. They're not bitter. They're better. They're not prideful. They're humble. (laughs) They're not resentful to God. They're closer to Him. Because they've learned the lesson that God's ways are higher. I was reminded this morning, seeing a little baby this morning in a, in a little um, car seat. A couple that we prayed for for a long time. They prayed and prayed to have a child. God didn't deliver. And instead of getting resentful and angry, they cooperated with what God wanted. And they went and they began to research and they adopted a beautiful baby girl. And when that girl gets to be six and eight and ten years old, they'll look back and they'll go, oh my goodness, what would our lives have been like without this precious gift? What would our lives be like without having trusted God when we didn't understand what he was doing and why he was doing it? God has a better plan many times. And then finally, God says no when he has a greater purpose. (laughs) You know, we are so self-centered. We think that God exists for every one of our needs. We exist for him. You understand that, right? (laughs) We're not the center of the universe. He is. In our consumer mindset, I think particularly in America, we have this mindset that everything revolves around us. Look at what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4. I love this passage. Here's the Apostle Paul. You should read in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 of all the sufferings that the Apostle Paul went through. Shipwrecked, beaten, betrayed. Look at what he says about it. He says, so we do not lose heart. Look at this. Though our outer self is wasting away. Entropy, gravity, old age, suffering. It's ha- and the older I get, the more I say, yes, the outer self is wasting away. <laughs> Look at what he says. But our inner self is being renewed day by day. It's getting stronger and stronger and stronger day by day. Inner, I'm being renewed internally. Paul says, this is all vanishing, but I'm marching toward a a better kingdom, a greater kingdom. My my internal fuel is being renewed every day. He says, for this light momentary affliction. (laughs) Another translation says, for this light temporary suffering. Paul says that his affliction was light and temporary. I say mine is kind of heavy and permanent, right? He says his is light and temporary. Momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient. They're temporary, he says. They're going away. But the things that are unseen are eternal. Wow. Externally, things don't always work out. Externally, there are things happen that we wish would not happen. What matters is the inside. And internally, even though you're facing the lion's den, even though lions are roaring in your life, and boy, they are intimidating and they are scary, internally, you can be renewed. We don't understand a lot of things. I don't understand a lot of things about life. I don't know everything there is to know about God. But there are two things that I'm sure of that I will bet the farm on. The first thing is that God loves me. Come hell or high water, I know that. The second thing that I know is that God's in control. And when lions roar in my life, if I can hold on to those truths, not understanding every answer to every question of why, And I prayed for you this, for this this week, that, that this would encourage you, that this would give you the kind of faith that, that gives you courage to stand and to not be weak in your faith. 
and to not be wimpy and not to crumble when challenges come and not to doubt God when challenges and sufferings come. If you can remember God loves you, that God's in control, that will see you through the toughest of times in your life and you'll come out the other end. Maybe years past it and say, boy, God had a bigger perspective. He had a better plan. He had a greater purpose. Or maybe, just maybe, you won't even know that until you get to heaven one day. And our eyes will be opened. And we'll see what he was doing. I told you about a guy named Tim, Han- Tim Hansel. I've mentioned him before. Um, Tim Hansel wrote a book many, many years ago. It's a very encouraging book. But he was injured as he was hiking at one time. He was very aggressive in his hiking. He, he was injured and injured himself to the point that he was permanently in pain, constant pain, and somewhat crippled. He says in his book, he says, I prayed hundreds, if not thousands of times for the Lord to heal me. That's what he says. Prayed and prayed and prayed for God to relieve this suffering, for God to take it away. And he says this, and he finally healed me. He goes on. He healed me of the need to be healed. That's the faith. That's the faith here. If you live your entire life having this immature faith that's looking for signs, stupendous events, all these wonders, that your God is only the God who gives you what you want when you want it, that your God is the God who always says yes, never no. You'll never come to understand the depths of the love that God has for you. You'll never come to understand His greater and higher purpose. What a shame. What a shame. He says in this book, he says, I'd like to buy $3 worth of God. $3 worth of God, please. Not enough to explode my soul or disturb my sleep, but just enough to equal a cup of warm milk or a snooze in the sunshine. I don't want enough of him to make me trust him when life doesn't make sense. I want enough of God to get my will, not his. I want ecstasy, not transformation. I want just a pound of the eternal in a paper sack. I would like to buy $3 worth of God, please. Transformation really scares us because it means total trust. Good times and bad. Total trust. When God says yes, and when God says no, that's when you experience transformation. And that's the kind of faith that he wants us to have. Remember from Daniel, God is loving. God is faithful. And that God is in control. When lions roar, hold on to that. Let's stand for closing prayer. Father, how guilty I have been so many times of being like a spoiled child. How many times, Father, that I've uh, doubted you when I didn't get my way. When I didn't understand that you had a bigger perspective than I do. A better plan, a greater purpose. Father, build within us a faith like that of Daniel's. Faith that prevails. It's not a victim faith that overcomes. That kind of faith will stand out in stark contrast to a world of shades of gray. And Lord, we will find, even through our suffering, that you are there. And we will not just know, but we will experience that you are indeed a God of love and a God who is in control. 
give us that faith, Father. May we remember these lessons this week. In Jesus' name, amen.